so my lab is mostly interested in how uh, root systems can adapt to different uh, macronutrient levels in the soil, especially, especially nitrogen, because we've not talked enough about nitrogen already today. Uh, what we, as we all know, like nitrogen uh, plants either get it directly from the soil or through symbiosis with uh, rhizobium. Uh, and what we are interested in is uh, what Giles already mentioned, um, how, why, does so, why some plants can have a symbiotic relationship with, nice, uh, with rhizobium, well, and why can other plants not have this symbiotic relationship. Uh, so we, we look at uh, two model organisms, Arabidopsis for non-legume plants and Medicago for legume plants. So the way I approach uh, this problem is by treating rhizobium as just not a stimulus Arabidopsis is exposed to in the, in the soil. So the question I ask is, uh, how does Arabidopsis perceive the rhizobium bacteria? Does it perceive it as, a, as an enemy, as a pathogen, and does it start a defense response, or does it perceive it as a possible symbiont and tries to uh, start a symbio symbiotic response like with mycorrhizal fungi? Or does it not perceive it at all? Is it completely neutral to rhizobium, and can I go home without a PhD? So our, uh, our hypothesis is that uh, there is significant overlap between the symbiosis and other responses. Uh, there is overlap and there's uh, some elements from pathogen response in the symbiosis, some elements from uh, lateral root development and some elements from nitrogen response and of course uh, the mycorrhizal fungi response. So we think that legumes have used uh, elements of, of these different pathways to create their own, their own response to rhizobium. They have co-opted uh, all these specific pathways and created a response to rhizobium. So, um, uh, well, our, my aim is to analyze how Arabidopsis responds to rhizobium. So what we are doing is we create a transcriptomic time series where we treat Arabidopsis with rhizobium, with a control, and with a pathogen. Uh, I'm just going to talk a bit about the, about the bacteria we use. Um, or rhizobium, I don't have to talk about anymore. Uh, the pathogen we use is Ralstonia solanaceaarum. It's a tropic and subtropic root pathogen. We picked it specifically because it's a pathogen for the, for the root system. So... Um, it's root specific. Uh, it enters the roots via wounds, uh, starts proliferating in the vascular system, and then the plant dies because it does not get any more water. It's a pretty, uh, pretty big uh, economic impact. Um, we are making our time series uh, in a cell-specific way because we are mostly interested in the early response, and we think it's uh, more relevant to look at specific cell types rather than a whole plant or whole root systems. We hope that if we do it uh, in... Because plants are composed of many cell types, if we look at specific cell types, we think we might have uh, a, be a more clear signal that we will get from our uh, transcriptomic series. And then when we combine the data we get from se several cell types, we have a nice pet uh, signaling pathway. So the cell types we are looking at uh, are pericycle cells, uh, because that is where the lateral root development starts, and cortex cells, because that is where the nodulation starts. So once we have the transcriptomics time series, we will integrate it with phenotypic data, which we already have. Uh, we have inoculated uh, Arabidopsis with uh, loads of different things, with uh, different concentrations of knot factor, with uh, uh, um, solution of dead rhizobium and with living rhizobium. But we only really see an effect if we inoculate with living rhizobium. What we see is that the lateral roots uh, are severely uh, reduced in length. Um, although there is no difference in lateral root primordia, so there's the same amount of lateral roots, but some of them, most of them are much shorter or not emerging at all. There's a slight reduction in main root length, and there's a quite significant increase in root hairs, both in length and number at the tip of the root. So we're quite happy about this, because this is uh, quite similar to what we see when we grow Arabidopsis on low nitrogen soils. So it, it seems that there is an overlap in the phenotypic response to rhizobium and the low nitrogen. Uh, something else we are doing is we are comparing data from different Arabidopsis accession numbers from all over the world and see if there's any difference in response to rhizobium between the accession numbers uh, and then see if we can exploit, uh, if we can get information about this difference and use it in our research. Um, there is not much difference, unfortunately. Most of them just have no lateral roots or very short lateral roots, like this one from Germany. But some uh, accessions, like this one from Tajikistan, uh, show a very reduced response, like there's actually very little uh, phenotypic difference between treated and untreated plants. Uh, so back to the time series, what we do is we treat plants for nine, uh, we, we grow plants for nine days on low nitrogen. Then we have different treatments. We have mock treatments. We treat them at, uh, we, we transplant them to high nitrogen soils, and we transplant them to a soil with rhizobium. Uh, we in, we uh, incubate them further for, for 48 hours. That we take samples at different time points. Uh, we sort the cells, and we do the expression analysis. Uh, we will do something similar with Ralstonia. We haven't really started uh, on the Ralstonia yet. 
parallel to that, we have other people in the lab doing uh, similar things with Arabidopsis thaliana mutants. We selected mutants uh, based on their phenotype on, on different nitrogen soils. So we treat them with different concentrations of nitrogen and we see we will do again cell sorting and expression analysis. And we also have someone doing the same for Medicargo, treated and untreated with rhizobium, and doing expression analysis uh, for the Medicargo. So we are just getting the first results from the transcriptomics. Uh, this is for two time points. We found quite a big list of differentially expressed genes, about 150. Um, the most interesting thing was that uh, about 15% of those were from uh, nitrogen regulation or nitrogen met metabolism. So there's, there seems to be an overlap in, in response there. Uh, and some other interesting genes were from immune, immune response and pathogen defense genes. We also found a couple of genes from the Rimmerin family, which is a family that uh, regulates microbe and um, plant interactions. It's also a family that's implicated in, in Medicago in the not factor response. And we found some stress genes. So the next step is to make a more coherent picture of the, of the transcriptomic time series. Uh, we will analyze all the data in the coming months and then uh, select some genes upon which we want to investigate further, probably by qPCR. Uh, that's pretty much my work. I want to thank the BBSRC for funding my research. I want to thank the University of Warwick for funding me and for other obvious reasons. The System Biology Training Center, of which I'm part, and for educating me. I want to thank my supervisors, Nigel and Miriam, and everyone in my lab, especially Jesper, who spent many sleepless nights sorting cells with help or without help from us. I was intrigued uh, why you actually, Ralstonia is actually a very fascinating pathogen. And it actually, the most important cell layer is the endodermis, because yes, well, that's the layer in which it has to break through to finally get to the vascular system. If we had money, we would also be looking at the endodermis cell, cell layer, but okay. there's, it's a question of funding okay. and prioritizing which cell layers you 